said, I pray that you would give us life today and give it to us through your word and amongst your people uh, for the sake of your glory in this world, your world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll dismiss the kids uh, now, Kingdom Kids. Uh, There's a teacher in the foyer, and they'll meet you to take you across the street to our CE Center. And I ask the rest of you to join me in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. Have you ever been lost? I mean, out in the middle of nowhere, no road signs, no gas stations, anything. Or maybe in the middle of a city. I mean, just endless streets and buildings and people. It just all starts to blur together. Now, I think we all know it's, it's kind of, it's actually harder to get lost these days. If you've got a smartphone on it, you can just punch in the adre- address. You, you can be, with technology, an idiot person, smartphone, and you're okay. You can get around. Uh, It's harder to get lost these days, and it's easier, because our our cultural culture tells us that you really don't need any guidance from tradition, or family, or the Bible. You don't need to listen to somebody else's directions. You make the map. And so many people following that advice, that thinking, after after perhaps years of wrong directions, wake up suddenly and, and, and ask, how did I get here? In Luke 15, Jesus tells three stories about being lost and found. And we looked at, uh, focused on the first two last week, but I want to read the whole chapter again to hear how, again, how they all fit together. So Luke 15, three stories. These, you never get tired of hearing these. Jesus Uh, Luke sets the scene for us in the first couple of verses. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp And sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father while he was still... Excuse me, he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost. And is found. Thanks be to God. Three stories. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Or as it is more famously known, the prodigal son. Last week we looked at themes that were running through all three. The lost, the found, the joy. And with this as the summary statement, I'm going to use it again this week. It's on the back of your worship folder. You may find that helpful to walk through this outline with me. God longs to find the one who's lost. So, return home and rejoice with him. Now, did you notice, though, how the last story was different? Well, of course, it's longer, more detail, more drama. But unlike the shepherd and the sheep, the woman and the the coin, the father doesn't go after the lost son. That's interesting. This story is from the perspective of the lost. Let's start back there at the beginning of this last parable. And I want to go ahead and read this this, uh, first part again so that this is clear in our uh, minds and fresh in our ears. 11 11 through 16. He said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the field, his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Lost. The sinner leaves the father, taking his gifts, but ends up empty and alone. I think that many people in our culture today might hear this story and and might have trouble seeing the problem right away. Um, The younger son doesn't ask for anything that isn't coming to him. The economic prospects might be better in town than on the family farm. You know, a lot of people have adult children that they'd like to get out of the house. Uh, show some initiative. Get out there in the marketplace. Um, this is a much more troubling story in ancient Israel. Many preachers have pointed out uh, before me the inheritance would have been given only after uh, the father was dead. So the son is kind of saying, you know, if you were out of the way, I could get on with my life. Or, which amounts to, I wish you were dead. Whoa. Whoa. Talk about dishonoring his father, going against God's command. But remember also, on top of that, how important the land was for Israel. This was their inheritance from the Lord, part of the covenant blessing. Sure, uh, the, family would, the, the land would still stay in the family with the older son who was there, but this son was walking away from it all. He wanted to cash out. Give me what's coming to me. And you all can go you know where. Jesus tells it pretty matter-of-factly in the beginning, uh, verse 12, the father divided his property between them. But 
the rest of the story makes clear that the, the son's insult and the father's heartache are all over this picture. In verse 13, in just a matter of days, after dividing up the property, the younger son packs up, heads out. He travels somewhere to a far country, uh, Gentile territory. You get the idea that he felt he had to go far enough away to get to a place where, where he was not identified with God's people, where he was, did not feel obligated to do his father's will, where he did, was not compared to his older, uh, more rule-keeping brother. When I get out of here, I will be free at last. I can be me. And he blows the wad. We don't know how long it takes, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's what, what should have been the down payment for the rest of his life was squandered in a short time on cheap thrills. And then it goes from bad to worse. Verse 14, when he spent everything, a severe famine arose. His cash is gone now, so this guy is not a player anymore. He's just a wage slave like everybody else. How low is he? Well, remember, for, for Jews... Uh, pigs were unclean animals. It's part of how we know this is Gentile territory. Um, and so he's, he's not eating them, uh, but he is down there with them. So he, he's unclean literally, filthy, and spiritually he's so hungry, he's tempted to elbow his way past some of these pigs to get at what they're eating. Whew. Oh, he had plenty of friends when he was out there picking up the checks. Another round on me. Now he's empty and alone. No one gave him anything. This is a picture of someone who's lost. Maybe this sounds like someone you love. Maybe this was you when you were younger. Maybe it's you today. Remember, Jesus is telling this story to sinners. Verse 1, tax collectors and sinners were coming to hear him. They were drawing near. They, they wanted to hear him. So understand, Jesus doesn't tell this story to shame them, but to invite them back home. The story of Israel and the story of all humanity is this. God brought us into his world and promised that we could share it all if we would simply live in loving obedience to our Heavenly Father. But we said, <laughs> thanks, I'll take what's coming to me, and I'm going to live my life my way, Bye bye That's, that, that is fundamentally what sin is. Sin is about personal autonomy. It is nobody's telling me what to do, not God, not, not any authority figure, not tradition, not religion. Sin is personal autonomy. Sin is is. It promises authenticity, finding your true self. If I could just strip away all these other obligations, all these other relationships and responsibilities, uh, then, I, then I can be me. Then I'll find out who I really am. And so instead of being shaped by, by your family and, and honest work and, and the, the faith of a community of believers, you try to define yourself somehow it ends up being in the clothes you wear and the car you drive and the parties that you go to and how many friends you have. Is that really better? If you or the person you love is not yet ready to come home to God, perhaps you're still in the stage if we were to freeze the story, if we were to pause and go to commercial at the place where he still has that wad in his pocket and he's still pulling out the bills and he's still having a great time. Yeah, you read the story and you're like, well, I'm not empty and alone. It's working out for me. Well, just remember, we can pause the story at any place and if we're, where you are, but understand, you, if you're on that road, you're on the road to defining yourself to, by all the things you can have and the experiences that you can have and the, the things that the world offers apart from God. You're on the road to empty, and alone. Now, where there's enough cash, you can still have a good time, sure. And it might look, it might look seedy, like, you know, drugs and 
alcohol and prostitutes. It might look really upscale, like five-star restaurants and weekend resorts. But sooner or later, you will find that it is a dead end. That's where he ends up. Sin has you breaking relationships and shirking responsibility. And if you keep stripping away every obligation, every relationship in your life, every bond to someone or something else, that kind of freedom will leave you empty and alone. You may not be with the pigs yet, but are you starting to feel hungry? Like I'm missing something. The story continues in verse 17. I'm just going to read through the first part of verse 20. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. I'm just going to stop right there. This is part two. This is, we've seen lost. This is found. Now, he's not all the way back yet, but you can, you can see there's, there's been a change. It's been a shift here, and it's big. Turn back to the father, believing your life would be better as his servant. Just those few verses I read bookended by these phrases. First, he came to himself, and then he came to his father. He came to himself. It's a very literal translation here in the ESV. Others have, he came to his senses. It's it's good as well. Or we can even say sometimes, uh, you know, when somebody is out cold, he came to. Like, like, whoa, woke up. This one day, this guy finally woke up. Now, this this he's going through a process. It's not about deeply philosophical musing, like you know, the philosophers, why are we here? This is a guy in a hog waller saying, what am I doing here? That, that's, what we're, that's where we're at. What am I doing here? This is insane. I'm starving to death while the hired hands at my father's house are having seconds. I'd be better off in the bunkhouse at dad's place than I am here. Now, at this point, you, we, we, it could be, if we pause the story again, we could be like, okay. Is this just this bratty kid getting what he deserves, and now he's going to run back to daddy? I need some more money. The nerve of this guy. (laughs) No, but we see right away, there's more going on here. This is where we see repentance. I hope you're paying attention. Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. Okay, but but I I can't just walk through the gate like nothing's happened. I'm going to have to face him. I'm going to have to face up to what I've done. What, what are the chances he, that he will take me in? It's, it's worth a shot. It's worth a shot at mercy. So he rehearses his speech. You ever, have you ever rehearsed your speech? Like, I, 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 this is going to be a hard conversation. I gotta, I've got to apologize I, I, but I've got to think through all the things I'm going to say. And that's what he's doing. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. This is where you have to start. This is where you have to start with repentance. It's where you have to start if you, want, if you need forgiveness, if you're trying to resolve conflict, if you're trying to restore a relationship that, that has been broken, that you have broken, you got to start here. Confession. Not just, I admit it, I did it, but owning it. Own your sin. I, what I did was wrong. I have sinned. And this son who wanted to be his own boss now has God and his father in their proper place. I have sinned against heaven. I've sinned against God. And before you, I've sinned against you. That, that's, that's also important. No, when, when you have wronged somebody else, acknowledge you've sinned against God, you've sinned against them. Own it. Acknowledge it. That's the only way you're going to resolve it. I can't tell you how many times I've talked about this in, in counseling situations. If you, if you want to fix it, you've got to start it by owning it. What you've done wrong, they will not forgive you. The other party will not forgive you. They will not trust you until they know you see what you've done against them was wrong. I have sinned. 
But folks, owning it is the doorway to forgiveness. Do you you understand? you, You can't do something like, well, I, I'm sorry if I offended you, just to say, but you're too sensitive. <laughs> no, that's not repentance. Well, I, I'm sorry uh, that I, 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 sh- I shouldn't have done that, but, you know, I was tired and things have been kind of hard lately. Like, okay, well, excuses. Yeah, you're, you're not owning it. Well, I know it was wrong, but, you know, when you said that, that really made me like, oh, shifting the blame. Sorry, that's, you're not owning it yet. And, it, when you're not, and until you own it, the other person cannot say, okay, you get it. I can, now like we can start talking about forgiveness. But until you have not conceded your guilt, your wrong, there is no opportunity, not just to restore the relationship, there's no opportunity for the other person to forgive you because you haven't owned up to your sin. They can't forgive you. None of those things will get you back all the way back home because it's not repentance because there's no confession. Own your sin. And so he says, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants instead. Right? You understand that? Don't deserve to be a son. I'd accept being a servant. Before... The son wanted, he said, I want what's coming to me. He, he thought the father owed him. Now he says, now I know I don't even deserve anything from you. Anything good from you to me would have to be a pure gift. Or you know the Bible word for that, right? Grace. That, that's, that's what it's going to have to be. If you've done wrong in a relationship and tried something like, well, again, again, you've done wrong in the relationship, you've broken the relationship, and you say, well, I'm willing to meet in the middle. <laughs> what? Uh, well, let's, let's, let's make a deal. Uh, no. Negotiation is not repentance. Negotiation is not repentance. Making demands is not repentance. On the other hand, you know you're in the realm of grace when you say something like, I know there is no way possible for me to ever make it up to you for what I've done. I can't. But I'm coming to you acknowledging, I'm owning what I've done wrong, and I I want to serve you, I want to love you anyway. I can never never pay it back, but I I want to be here and I want to be for you. It's the right thing to do. If there is no humility, no submission, we're still back at the beginning of the story. Give me what's coming to me. And guess what? You're still lost. But I wonder if today maybe you have come to yourself like the lights come on. Have, have you awakened to the insanity of holding out against God? This, this son shows you what it looks like to come home, what it means to return, to repent. And when the lost is found, there will be joy. That's the next part here. Uh, picking up in the middle of the paragraph where we left off. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Well, that went better than expected. All three stories, lost, found, joy. Joy, you will find that the father is waiting to welcome you back as his son. Not just a servant. As a son. Uh, Preachers like me 
may read between the lines to imagine that the, son, the father was always, every day, looking out on the horizon, just wondering if that son would come back someday. It is very clear that when he sees him, he does not, well, do what we could imagine. Doesn't, doesn't turn around, walk back in the house and slam the door. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't make the son come groveling to his feet. Doesn't do that. As soon as he sees him, still a long way off, his heart leaps and his feet are flying. He he hasn't yet even heard a word from this wayward son, but the fact that he has returned says enough. He he is embraced and kissed. You can imagine the son a little flustered. Like, I mean, uh, this whole journey home, he's been rehearsing his speech. I want to make sure he's, he's got the lines just right, and, and he, can't even get, he can't even get started, but he, he, he gets there. Uh, the son professes his wor- unworthiness to be a son, but his father is treating him like he's the favorite. Remember how destitute he was? We can imagine that the, the fancy clothes that he had bought with his wad were, were now uh, uh, ragged from hog chores, and... Probably had a certain aroma, maybe. We can not read too much into there. Um, And yet, here, the father says, bring the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. This is not the wardrobe of a servant. In fact, uh, scholars say we should probably understand that the best robe would have been the father's robe. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Kill the fattened calf. They would be preparing this animal for months for just the right occasion. And when you know, when, when they're killing the fatted calf, this is the biggest, biggest to do, the, the biggest party of the year. And do you see the irony? This is what the kid wanted. The, the son wanted the, the high life, the big blowout with him at the center. That's what he was going for. And he had for for a fleeting moment he he enjoyed that before but here he is the life of the party once more out of the grace the generosity the mercy of the father some of you have read a great little book called the prodigal god by tim keller he, this is a pastor who plays with the word prodigal. We, we, you know, we, we hear the prodigal son, the prodigal son. We, we don't use that word for virtually anything else. But the word, it's an old word, of course, and, and the, the literal meaning of it is, is an extravagance that, is, that, that amounts to a, a seeming like a, a wastefulness. And so, of course, the prodigal son, it's not talking about his, him being wayward so much as it's describing that uh, when the verse says he squandered his property in reckless living. Prodigal. But do you see a certain prodigality? Do you see a certain extravagance that seems like wastefulness? Why would you throw a party for this guy? Jesus wants sinners to know this is how the heart of God is moved when sinners come back home, when a sinner repents. Not with, a, not with a cold shoulder. There is nothing you can say to bring you back into this family. There, don't even, how dare you show your face here after what you've done. That is not what the Father does. He pulls out all the stops. He says, gather around, rejoice with me, for what was lost is found. God sees your return. And folks, if, if, you're, if a return for you is needed today, th- think, think of what is waiting for you. you. You anticipate, you know that, yes, it is true, this is, this is what this is, you have every reason to expect that God would be angry with you. And yet, to have this story, to have Jesus wants you to know that if you would just come home, you would be welcomed. You would be received. You would be 
celebrated? Not celebrated for your sin. Not celebrated for your lostness. Not celebrated for the ways that you struck out on your own and wasted all that he gave you. Celebrated because you had been lost to him. And he is, you've been restored. You were as good as dead. But you are alive to him and for him. Can, can you believe that? If that's, if that, if that's where, if you're, just, if you're just around the bend from God, from the Father, and wondering, do I dare take that step? Oh, can you trust Jesus? That God is ready and wait, willing to, he's waiting to welcome you, waiting to say, let's go, let's celebrate. If, you're, if, if, if you have done this, if you said, oh, yeah, I've, I've come, then understand the, uh, you understand this, right? When you, if you've had the privilege, the blessing to become a parent, and one of the first things that happens when, for you when you get to that place is, um, amongst so many other emotions and things that you're thinking about, someplace, very, at some point, very early on, you're like, my parents looked at me like this, right? You've had that. If you're a parent, you remember that. My parents held me with this joy and this delight. If you have been a believer, don't forget. And, and you, to, for you, it might seem like a long time ago that you made that turn, that you came home to God. Don't forget when he first saw you, the joy that he had. If you knew that God longs for the lost to be found, wouldn't you come home? And, like, yeah, great story. That, but there's more. There's like a whole, there's a whole other paragraph. Uh, Here, we could stop, they all lived happily ever after, except it doesn't end this way. Verse 25. Now, the older, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew up, uh, drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. This didn't happen every Friday night. This this wasn't wasn't normal. Uh, And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours... Came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So the last part of this is we're, we've, we've kind of come back. Lost, found, joy. Lost? The grumbler rejects the Father's grace and may end up as the lost one. I used grumbler here as I used sinner before. The, these, again, the, the two sons reflect the two groups in Jesus' audience in verses 1 and 2, the beginning of the chapter. The tax collectors and sinners came to hear him. The Pharisees and scribes were grumbling. Why? Because Jesus welcomed sinners. Why was the older brother angry? Because the father welcomed the sinner back home. Let's go go deeper. Why is the older brother angry? Well, at one level, because the younger brother didn't deserve it. He devoured your property with prostitutes, and you killed the fattened calf for him? That's what the younger brother said, too. I am unworthy. Except those are miles apart. The younger brother was willing, with, with, with humble repentance, willing to accept whatever the father would give. The older brother says it out of pr- a prideful sense of his own entitlement. 
We, we thought it was the younger brother that, that thought he was entitled. Give me what's coming to me. But the older brother is just as entitled. I, I want what's coming to me. Unwilling to accept the father's grace toward his brother, you're, you're giving him a party? I deserve the party. I deserve the party. Like, whoa. His attitude, well, he says, I, I've served you for years. You owe this to me. I never disobeyed you. But his attitude reveals something much, much less than a loyal, loving son. He doesn't deserve it. I do. I want what's coming to me. You served veal to the whole village for that traitor's son. You never gave me a sack of burgers to celebrate with my friends. That's the difference here. The, the fattened calf or a, a young goat. The goat was like, well, that was, a, that was a, a nice thing, but it was nothing compared to the fattened calf. Like, you didn't even give me nothing for me to celebrate with my friends. Where's the father in that picture? This is loving loyalty? Hardly. And out of a heightened sense of justice, this older brother has no room for grace. And so, out of a principled position, he has refused to come in. Who's lost? Who won't come home to the father? Jesus says that the father comes out to him, pleads with him. We do have someone the father seeking the lost in this story. We thought the, we thought the father didn't seek the lost. Here, we, we got it in this story. Just like the shepherd sought after the one lost sheep, just as, as the woman swept the floor to, to seek the, the lost coin. Here, the father is going out to the son who is standing outside. I'm refusing to come in. Son. Son, you, you don't get it. You don't understand the love that I have for my sons, I, of course I love you. You've, you've always been with me. You always, what mine is, has always been yours. But it is right, it is fitting for us to celebrate when the lost is found. The father seeks the one who doesn't even realize that he's lost. I wonder if you've maybe sensed that today as well. You could imagine him saying, he's saying, son, my, my grace to sinners has cost you nothing. It is, it is right and good to celebrate when sinners repent and when sinners come home. And do you see how the story, the parable ends before we know what the older brother did, how, how he reacted, how he, re did, the, did the older brother come in? Did he finally say, oh, dad, you're right. Let's celebrate. Or, ah, you are just, a, he is playing you for a fool. He's just taking advantage of you. No, no way I, am I going in there. We don't know. Partly because Jesus is not just trying to tell a good story. He's trying to put the weight to leave the burden on the grumblers. What are we going to do? Are we going to... to Share the heartbeat of the Father for the lost. Are we going to step away from our principle justice to recognize that if we got justice, do we really think, I have always obeyed the Father? <laughs> really? I don't think you know your own heart very well. I deserve, I deserve God celebrating me. But you do understand, you, you know you get it when you say, I am unworthy to be even called your son. I'd, I would gladly just be your servant, and I would, I would take that. And he says, servant, yes, I'll do you one better. I'm going to make you a son, a son or a daughter, an heir once more, part of my family. This, this last part should speak to us if we have been perhaps a Christian for years, and maybe you grew up in the church, and, and you never strayed. You never wandered. You weren't the prodigal. Oh, yes, others, others did. They left. Some of them came back, and some of them didn't. But you, oh, I was always here. Do you look at the, do you look at the sinners 
maybe in the room, maybe on the street. You look, look at the deadbeats and the druggies and look at the promiscuous and the progressives and oh, them. God wouldn't, God wouldn't want them. He certainly wouldn't throw a party for them. I think, we, I think we all know who deserves God's love. But if we really knew God's heart for the lost and how lost we ourselves are, we would say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm unworthy to be called your son, but if you would just let me be one of your servants, that would be enough. He says, oh no. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you stay at the level of servant. I want to make you part of my family. I want to welcome you in. And man, we've got, a, we've got some celebrating to do. This, the, the earlier story said the, the, the celebration here for a sinner who repents is, is only a, a glimpse of the celebration going on in heaven. And as we said last week, the, we don't want to be content that up there somewhere, there are celebrations going on for people who are coming to know Christ somewhere else. Let's pray that God so, by the, by the words of Jesus, by the scriptures, even in this chapter, so shape us to reflect, to beat with God's heartbeat for the lost and for the joy that when they are found that we will want to seek, that we will want to celebrate, that we will see more celebration here that is only amplified in heaven now and for eternity when we all celebrate with our heavenly father as, well, treated just like his son. Let's pray. Lord, I'm sure we all fit into this story in some way or another. I pray that that would be deeply felt and understood today. I even want to pray that by your Holy Spirit in this moment that you would help us to come to our senses, to come to ourselves as you have made us to be, as you want to make us to be like your son.